Welcome to part two of episode four on solutions for procrastination. We're going to be delving into more solutions continued from our last episode. But before we do, I want to go ahead and summarize a little bit about what we concluded from last time. So from the fact that the emotional mind is always a factor and that our willpower is limited, we concluded that if we can change the accessibility of one option over the other, when we plan, we enhance the likelihood that that action takes place. Now there are a lot of other implications and strategies that could be drawn from those facts, but to really delve into those oftentimes it's required to understand the actual context of your situation, uh, and for that I recommend that you come in and talk to somebody and we can help you strategize one-on-one -on -one what the best options for you are. So now let's talk about one of the other general strategies based upon our next set of conclusions from episode three that I've seen to be one of the most beneficial. So our conclusions were that we don't consider the emotional differences of a future context from temporal discounting that we're more drawn towards rewards which arrive sooner. We want what we want now. So it's necessary we plan for the emotional context of the moment that we either study or become distracted to lean more towards studying. And we can do this by creating rewards associated with studying, which arrive sooner than the grade or the professor's feedback, which is usually something we're only rewarded by weeks down the line. One powerful form of doing this is through assignment breakdown. Behavioral economist Dan Ariely did a great piece of research on the effects of the strategy. Let's say that you were required to proofread three essays in 21 days. Which would you prefer from the following due date schemes? Would you prefer that the first essay is due in seven days, the second in 14, and the third in 21? Would you prefer to pick your own due dates between now and 21 days, however you'd like them to be? Or would you prefer all three papers to be due any time you want in those 21 days? So literally, as long as you get them in in 21 days, you're fine. It seems intuitive that given option three, that we can do these anytime we'd like, we have full flexibility to manipulate them into our schedule at times when we think that we definitely should or shouldn't do them, and that that flexibility is appealing. But truthfully, for the sake of performance, for the sake of doing well, the results were as follows. In the first group, they found about 140 errors with about three delays. In the second group, about 100 errors were found, only about eight delays. And in the final group, the one that you think would be best, the average errors found was about 70 and delays 13. A steady decrease in performance as the due dates are less spread out and less rigid. Professors reacted to this phenomenon in different ways. I had a professor who took this to mean that he shouldn't even assign essays until the last two weeks before they're due because nobody's going to work on it until then anyhow. In an ideal world, and the way your high school teachers may have done this for you is to break larger assignments up into incremental steps that were due spaced out throughout the year. But in college, this is rarely if ever the case. Teachers expect us to be able to create our own deadlines and engage in assignment breakdown effectively. Some of the trouble is that we either aren't really sure of the best way to go about this, since we didn't have to do it in high school, or we don't realize how important it was and still is. And so we don't break down assignments at all, but rather end up approaching that 20-page essay the night before as just one gigantic, stressful task. My question is, why be David when you can be Goliath? You'll have many tasks throughout your academic life that feel like this scenario and this won't stop in grad school. What we often don't realize is that this situation is within our control. If we plan for it, we can change roles. And then not only will we complete tasks more frequently and get more quickly rewarded for them because, well, it takes less time, but tasks will seem a lot less threatening. The most common form of implementing this con uh, concept, the most common form of implementing this concept is through goal setting. Now, when we set a goal, we are creating the size and difficulty of our tasks. We're choosing what we step into the ring with. Because we don't foresee how our emotional conditions will change with time, 
We often set overly optimistic goals and fail to consider how much more appealing it will be to do something other than the challenge, the Yokozuna, we set up for ourselves. The usual recommended process is to go from monthly goals to weekly goals to daily goals. And this is a great start. It allows for some of the emotional pressure to be felt as due dates are kept in mind. And it will start the process of receiving quicker reward from task completion. However, even daily goals tend not to encourage as much focus or offer as much emotional reward as they can. Remember that we're trying to restructure tasks such that they represent some of the emotional appeal the distractions do. Frequent, quick rewards that remind us that we're on the right track. To do this, we can break down daily goals even further into what I like to call active goals. Active goals are created with more than just the task in mind. They are created with motivation and reward in mind, and they attempt to restructure work such that it more closely resembles the quick, frequent rewards distractions do. This is an example of what an active goal list might look like. You'll notice this is actually a lot more detailed than your typical daily to-do list, which might just say, finish math homework, start reading for chemistry, etc. And this is for good reason. Let's go over the key elements that set this kind of list apart and contribute to productivity. One of the primary key elements is that you create tasks with a time frame. And not just any time frame, but one that is short. You can't really make it too short, but a recommendation of 20 to 40 minutes, depending on how comfortable you are at focusing on the task, is good. This does a number of things. The short time frame moves your emotional interaction with a sense of completion. Whereas you may be working on a 20 page essay, you'll be done with a part of it in no more than 30 minutes, advancing the emotional connection with task completion. What this also does is require that your description of the task be extremely specific. Remember, the more specific, the less choices we have to make before we get started the less intimidating the task will seem, and then again, the more truly we'll feel that we actually completed something and received that positive emotional feedback. The final element of this is simply that you don't forget that the structure of each task feels rewarding. Having a checkbox in place or a post-it note to put into a completed pile or remembering to cross out these tasks when finished is far more than trivial. It contributes to altering the often abstract relationship we hold with our academic work into something more concrete, which in turn strengthens our emotional connection to it. There's a commercialized version of this technique I'd like to mention called the Pomodoro Technique. Now, Pomodoro means tomato in Italian, hence the large tomato you now see, but that's not important. It's not a technique which incorporates the right flavor of the tomato in tasks. It was simply developed during a time when a lot of people had kitchen timers that looked like tomatoes and could use them to time their tasks. I like this technique because it takes elements we just discussed as being important about an active goals list and integrates them into one holistic system. It gives quick reward for task completion. It integrates incentives so that you not only get a reward from striking off the task, but from being rewarded with a kind of task currency, noticing how many tasks you've completed in the last several hours. And it allows for feedback. Oftentimes in academics, you can work on something for hours and still feel like you haven't gotten much done. By integrating feedback, you become that much more encouraged as you connect with having actually made progress. Now, I won't go through every detail of this technique with you, but this is what the website looks like, and I'll include a link to it in the episode notes. You'll be able to find any relevant details on it there, and then adapt it to your needs and interests as necessary. A, a myriad of apps exist that also replicate this as well, if you're less interested in using pen and paper to keep track of tasks. That concludes this introduction to Active Goals and our Study Smart series on procrastination. Remember, effectively managing your time and fulfilling your goals while in school is a continual process. Our center is here to help you with that process. New time management solution videos will be added over time, so check back for updates. Also, check out our website where you can set up free appointments to optimize your academic life with a trained specialist. And connect with us via Facebook to be kept up to date on latest resources. 
or heck, just stop by and say hi. I hope you've enjoyed this and other videos in our Study Smart series. This is Samuel Rowe from the Learning Center signing off and reminding you to study smarter.